Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our stories about Pensacola, North America's first place city. Today we are beginning episode one of what I call the final Spanish period, a period of 40 years which began in 1781, following the siege in which the Spanish defeated the British. In that siege, General Bernardo de Galvez and a force of about 7,500 men moved into this area and circled Fort George, which was on today's uh, Lee Square, and overcome the, overcame the British force after about a 60-day siege. With that, uh, General de Galvez supervised the removal, first of all, of the British soldiery, most of whom were, uh, were sent by ship to New York City. And the balance, of course, was uh, the persons here, of course, were, were civilians, and they departed the area little by little. Now, they left not because the Spanish forced them out, but because the British chose to leave on religious differences. The Spanish welcomed them to stay, but the British would have had to, to convert to the Catholic Church, and most did not wish to do that. That, of course, there was an exception, of course. Those British uh, citizens who had become farmers along the Mississippi River, most of them did elect to stay. Well, General de Galvez remained only a short time and then turned the reins of government over to a man named Arturo O'Neill. Now, Arturo O'Neill, that is hardly your normal Spanish name, so it deserves just a little bit of explanation. Back 200 years before, back in 1588, the Spanish had attempted to invade Great Britain. They had sent a great fleet which was defeated in battle. The surviving vessels moved north through the North Sea, circled around the north of uh, Scotland, came down through the Irish Sea, and several were, were beached in Ireland by a terrible storm. And a number of the men who were on those vessels elected to stay. They remained a while, they, re, they had uh, 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 growth of family with the Irish citizens, and then later on some again began to return to Spain. And we assume that one of these men was the descendant of that group, and of course that's how he got the name Arturo O'Neill. Well, O'Neill set forth. He, he had to do what, uh, what the British government had had to do back in 1763. He had to rebuild the entire population of Pensacola. And so the, he turned, of course, first of all, to, to uh, New Orleans and to Spanish Louisiana, which was populated by largely French people, but a number of Spanish because they had been there now for about 20 years. And the men who became, who became the first settlers in this new wave were largely either civil servants or members of the military. Now, these men uh, had all kinds of names. We remember some of the old, old Spanish names who began to settle here then. Names like Moreno and Gonzalez, and uh, uh, first of all, of course, the, the people who came as military, there was de Villiers, and there was Guillemard, and then, of course, uh, still others like Brosenham and de la Roa. They, this whole wave of people came, and they were mostly men. There were very few women that came with this group settling in the new Spanish period. And, of course, these men were here for a time, and, and they got lonely. And so the story goes, basically, what, they, what some of them did was to return to New Orleans where they purchased young, attractive, black female slaves, brought them to Pensacola where they cohabitated, became families, and after a time, many of them actually married within the church, and their families, of course, uh, generation after generation, became known as the Pensacola Creole population. That was a significant part of who came here with the, with the first government. Well, as, uh, as Mr. Uh, Mr. O'Neill began his settlement here, he had a, a, another concern, and we must, we must understand how things were, went there from 1783 uh, forward. When the Treaty of Paris was signed, this of course created the new United States. Part of the land between the Atlantic and the Mississippi River was dedicated to Indian settlement. And a significant part of that was just north of the Florida border, what we today call the Alabama or Mississippi Territory. And it was into this, of course, that the Creeks, the Seminoles, the Choctaws were able to move with impunity. They made their settlements, built their villages, and for the next, next 25 years or so, they were there, the major part of the population. Now, trade began between those Indians and the Spanish. And this, of course, is a very important part of our story. We have to revert back into the British period once again to where when the Indian trader John Stewart had arrived here and he had begun a trade with the Choctaws and particularly with the Creeks where they the Indian tribes brought furs and skins here in the fall and traded them for British goods. It was a wonderful trade. It, it built a, a great economy for the British and that existed of course 
when the Spanish took over. And immediately, uh, Governor O'Neill said, well, all right, we want to continue that just as it has been. And so he, he re revised the trade just a little bit. He made a little bit of a mistake, a little political mistake. At first, he assigned his nephew as the Indian trader, and there was a little bit of hanky-panky that went on there, but that's, that's really not an important part of our story. The important difficulty was that when the new trade began in, the, in 1782, the, the goods that were brought in to trade with the Indians were, had been made in Spain. And unfortunately, the, Spanish, the Indian tribes, particularly the women, did not like the Spanish goods. They wanted the quality British goods that they had been giving. Uh, been receiving in the past. And so Governor O'Neill turned to another to an alternative. He learned quickly that there were two young men who had been Indian, uh, Indian traders trained with the British back in the Carolinas uh, even before the American Revolution. These men had been Tories. They were driven out of the Carolinas and opened an Indian trade in East Florida where, where they were very successful. And their names were William Panton and, and uh, John Leslie. And Panton and Leslie were now invited by Governor O'Neill to come here to run the Indian trade for the Spanish. And that trade would include all the way over to, on the east to St. Mark's and to the west at Mobile. And Panton and Leslie were to have a large sale, a, a say in running the monopoly. And they arrived, and of course the only caveat they had was, they would, yes, they wanted to do the job, they thought this would be a, a good, uh, good opportunity for them as well as the Spanish, but they wanted to be able to practice their Presbyterian religion. And so they were given that agreement, providing, of course, that they did this quietly and did not try to proselytize any of the Spanish people who were here. And that was the agreement. And so Span uh, Panton and Leslie arrived, and they brought, they, they found as they got there a wonderful, well, one of his, history's wonderful little accidents. They discovered as they arrived that a young man who had been their friend in school back in the Carolinas now had become the Creek Indian chief. Now that requires a little bit of explanation. This young man was named Alexander McGillivray. His father, Lachlan, was a trader among the Creeks. His mother was a uh, part French and part part Creek lady, and consequently young Alexander was a, a good mixture. He was Scots, he was Irish, uh, Scots, uh, uh, Indian and French, and a, a very, very bright young man. And he had, as I said, went to school with the Panton and Leslie, and by happy chance with the death of the old Creek chief, the tribe had no, noticed that this man was particularly bright and able, and he had become the chief of the Creeks. And now here were Panton and Leslie beginning to open up their Indian trade, and there was a dear, a close friend handling the, much of the negotiations for the Indians. It worked out beautifully. Now, the first thing that happened, of course, was that, that McGillivray, Ale Ale Alexander McGillivray, had a house here in Pensacola, a very large house down on the, on the waterfront, and he recognized that in his new job, he really wasn't going to be in Pensacola all that much, so he, in turn, he immediately leased that house to Panton and Leslie, and that became the headquarters for the new Indian trade. And many of the pictures that we see in the, in the, uh, in the overall story of this period are of that building, which uh, it was a was in use and uh, continued in use all the way well into the American period. Well, Patton and Leslie and McGillivray were quite successful. Things were going along very well, but then uh, a problem arose. By now, into the into the latter part of the 1780s, uh, there a lot of people from Georgia. Who were, who were anxious to have more land for themselves, began looking across the western Georgia border into this Indian territory in the Alabama-Mississippi territory and saying, well, we can, we can just march in there and take that. And so beginning about 1785 or 6, uh, settlers coming from Georgia began to move into the Alabama territory. And you can imagine there was immediate conflict with the Indians who were there. Uh, violence broke out, and it became Alexander McGillivray's job to try and put, the, put the, a ceiling on it, bring peace to the area, and he was not succeeding. Well, by about this time, we're four years into this story now of the, of the uh, final Spanish period. About this time, the new United States changed government. But from uh, 1783 forward, we had been operating under what they called the Articles of Confederation, which did not work. And in 1789, the new United States government under, under our Constitution came into effect. George Washington was elected as our first president, the first Congress was seated, and the first cabinet was in place. 
Well, about this very time, a very serious uprising began on the Georgia Creek border. Uh, violence took place, and the, uh, George Washington was very anxious to do right by the Indians. He, was, he recognized that we had a treaty, and therefore justice should be done. So he sent his secretary of, of the army, a man named Henry Knox, who had been with him during the, during, with the president during the, the, uh, the revolution. Henry Knox was sent forward to investigate the situation to, to see who was right. And Knox returned to, to New York, where the capital was at that time, and told the president, look, uh, the Indians are right. Our people who are coming out of Georgia are violating the treaty. We've got to do something. Well, uh, Washington wasn't sure exactly how to proceed, but finally he decided to invite Alexander McGillivray and several of the Creek chiefs to come to New York to talk this thing over and see what they could do. And so McGillivray, along with six chiefs, made the long journey on horseback to New York City, and McGillivray was apparently something of a showman because they arrived and rode right down Wall Street in the full Indian regalia with all of the feathers that went with it, and they made quite a stir. And finally, they, the, the uh, discussions began, and when it was all over, here's what happened. The United States wanted to give uh, a show of force with McGillivray himself. They didn't, they, the new, new United States did not have the resources to send an army down there, so they wanted to, to show the, the settlers, the Georgia settlers, that the, indeed the, the United States was behind the Indian Treaty. And so what they did, they made Alexander McGillivray a brigadier general in the United States Army. They gave him a uniform and a certificate, and he was told to go back and just show the settlers that he was backed by the United States. Well, McGillivray returned, and he came down to, to Pensacola and showed his friend William Patton what he had gotten, and Patton said, well, it looks, looks promising, maybe this will help. Well, the Spanish, of course, had been witnessing all this. They got word of what the, the United States had done, and they, the Spanish here were very concerned about the United States encroaching on their, on their rights and about the, their relationship with Indians. So they quickly summoned Mr. McGillivray, or Chief McGillivray, to New Orleans, where the Spanish government, uh, recognizing that he had been given a, a, a brigadiership in the United States, they now made McGillivray a, 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 a major general in the Spanish armor, complete with uniform and all that went with it so that he now had a, a, a generalship in a field grade uh, uh, office in two armies plus being the chief. Well, he got back to Pensacola, told uh, uh, Patton what had happened, and of course everyone said, well, this probably is going to help put uh, the, the, the ceiling on the problems. And of course, all of this was, as all this was going on, the British, who never gave up hope that they were going to regain all of the force, that all of the land that they had lost uh, during the, our, the loss of the Americans in the, in the Revolutionary War, the British now were, were they had agents circulating around here in the southeast, and they now sent a message to McGillivray to come to St. Mark's and talk with them to see what, how they could fit into this picture. And he went. And the, uh, the chief of the British service there said, I'm sorry, I can't make you a field grade officer, but I have here your uniform. You are now officially a colonel in the British Army. So we have McGillivray having uh, uniforms from three different nations. He comes back to Pensacola, talks with Panton and Leslie again, and, and they jokingly say, well, uh, what he really needs now is a tailor to take care of all these things. And I, now I wish, I wish I could tell you that this, all of these me uh, mechanics were going to put down the problem that McGillivray and the Creeks were facing uh, in the Alabama, uh, Span uh, Mississippi Territory. It, that was not the case. The, the violence continued, the, the, the battles went on, and unfortunately for us, uh, McGillivray about this time contracted pneumonia. Uh, he was on a, a venture, a, a peacekeeping venture, and came back to Pensacola in November of 1793. He was a sick man, and while he was here, pneumonia uh, developed. It was very serious. It turned to be fatal, and McGillivray died and was buried with full Masonic honors because he was a Mason. He was buried in the courtyard of the Panton Leslie headquarters here in Pensacola. Later, his sister, McGillivray's sister, came and reclaimed the remains and took them back, and he was reburied in a, a Creek Cemetery. But the, the Alexander McGillivray period is one of the most exciting we have in all of Pensacola's early history, and I, I wish we had a, had a different ending, but unfortunately he died. And if you, one goes down uh, on Main Street, one can see the plaque today which stands where he was buried at the Panton Letley headquarters.